Right, good morning everyone um, who's joining us from Europe and anybody who's over in Asia, uh, good afternoon and, and welcome back after the national holiday break. Um, welcome to our third and the last of the three webinar series um, which has been brought to you by Hawksford um, in conjunction with us here at the China Britain Business Council or CBBC uh, for short. It's been a uh, incredibly insightful series so far uh, and I'm sure today uh, will be as insightful as the first two. Uh, so if you've listened to all three, I'm sure you've I'm sure you've found them incredibly useful. If you've not, uh, then there will those uh, webinars are also available uh, online. Um, so we can share those links, or Hawksford can share those links uh, with you afterwards if you missed the first uh, couple of installations. Um, so this webinar um, will focus on Hawksford's recommended five steps. To successful integration of your business in China. Um, however, just to quickly introduce who we are at CBBC and why we're doing this uh, today uh, with, with Hawksford, who are one of our uh, member companies. Um, we at CBBC aim to help British and Chinese businesses and organizations work together in China, the UK, and third markets around the world. We have 65 years of experience, and uh, we've got a big birthday dinner coming up soon, actually, in Beijing. Um, and we have experts in 11 UK offices and 15 uh, Chinese locations. We support companies of all sizes and sectors whether they are new entrants to the market or have established operations in order to realize the full potential of the fastest growing market in the world. Our unrivaled network of 130 staff across 26 locations in the UK and China understands the sectoral, geographical and cultural aspects of business success in China. This personal expertise is complemented by a range of CBBC events, research and consultative services tailored to meet the specific requirements of companies. Uh, we work to leverage the knowledge of our members, such as Hawksford, uh, to ensure that our clients can access the best advice and services, whatever stage of market entry they are at. Um, we work closely with the Department for International Trade, the Foreign Office and across uh, UK government to highlight export opportunities for UK companies and investment opportunities for Chinese organizations. We are an independent organization offering trusted, impartial advice while maintaining close partnerships with UK and Chinese governments. Um, as I said, working with members in order to get you, you know, UK businesses uh, who are looking at the Chinese market, the best information um, is, is really what we're all about. And I've been doing a lot of work personally and CBBC have been doing a lot of work with Hawksford uh, over the past year. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's fair to say that they are generous in sharing their knowledge. They have an incredible amount of expertise. Uh, and I would encourage all of you to follow up with Hawksford uh, at the end of this webinar who'll be sharing their contact details with you I'm sure. Um, the topic today is something that I think is often uh, underestimated by Western businesses who are setting up in uh, the Chinese market. Um, you know the localization of your business processes, uh, the management style, uh, the structure of your business and evolving the way that you work to get the most out of the opportunities that China offers. Uh, it's often a challenging place to do business, but we find uh, that companies who get it right and who can adapt uh, can both be very profitable and can learn a lot about their wider global operations and become a stronger business overall uh, from the knowledge that working in the Chinese market um, has given to them. Um, so I'm not going to go on uh, any further than that. Uh, but we're really lucky today to have uh, Fabio Stella, um, who is based over in Shanghai uh, for Hawksford, um, and he uh, works on China business development for them, uh, who has an incredible amount of knowledge and uh, expertise and experience uh, in, in the Chinese market, um, and he's sharing some of his uh, nuggets of information uh, with you, uh, which can prove incredibly valuable to your planning and development for the Chinese market. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand back over to Fabio. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jack, for the kind introduction as always, and to CBBC for co-hosting this third and last webinar while supporting British business in China. My name is Fabio Stella, and I head the sales and business development team here at Oxford. Today's episode will try to close our recent series of three by laying out practical examples of successful market entry by foreign players in China. 
Please do not worry in case you missed our previous appointments, as Jack mentioned, slides and audio recordings will be made available to you via Oxford and CBBC channels. Right on with a very initial overview of what our, our webinar today will touch. And the title will be Five Case Studies for Successful Market Entry Here into China. So let's pass on to a very quick and time-saving overview of our presence and practice in Asia Pacific as corporate accounting and tax consultants following international pets of UK companies in this region. Keep in mind our six offices in Greater China, Beijing, Shanghai, Suzhou, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, including our headquarters for Northeast Asia in Hong Kong, looking over Japan as well. Whereas Singapore leads the way for investment and services in the Asian uh, markets. Oxford provides you with around 100 professionals per jurisdictions, namely China, uh, Greater China, Hong Kong included, and Singapore, and dedicated account managers sharing your business views and language, whatever you might need us. Few more words about myself, in case you didn't meet me in our previous uh, session last month. I've been now seven years with the company with assignments in Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Shanghai, where I'm now based. Uh, listed below, you find uh, the areas of expertise I gained during my career, but please do feel free to contact me via, at any time via fabiostella at oxford.com. Without further ado, let's get to the table of contents of today's webinar. First, we'll state the main target of today's slides. After that, we'll analyze in order uh, cases from automotive, F&B chains, education, wine and spirits, and household furniture sectors. Once uh, completing a deep overview of each and every case, we'll then close today's remarks with general takeaways for you to treasure while planning your next move on China. Right on with our introduction, China is not anymore just another factory of the world. It has successfully moved into a consumer-based economy that calls for new products, technologies, and solutions that you might provide customers with. A tip to brands, tra travel retail is, of course, not enough if you want to tap into the potential of this market. And if we look, especially at the table in the, in the right hand of, of, the, of this slide, you might notice the exposure per shops listed here in the, in the Chinese table uh, per retailer in the fashion industry. You might also see the title from Jin Daily, which is one of the news outlets that we, that we follow here in China. Uh, one of the main um, victims of, of trade war, uh, namely uh, Tiffany, is actually trying to strengthen his presence over here because foreign brands and traders have seen shifts from overseas consumption in, in Chinese tourists and a presence in China, especially if you're, if you're targeting a, a product sector, it's becoming more and more needed over here. Of course, you've heard, you've heard about Jack in the initial address today. Well, let me introduce to you CBBC Man Managing Director here in China, uh, Tom Simpson, uh, through his view on the digital strategy that companies really have to roll out over here. Quote, unquote, having a grasp of the digital sphere is essential for companies that wish to target China's consumers by Recapping this slide in one sentence only, look at China's share of B2C and C2C online retail and notice that this e-market is basically bigger than the next 10 combined as a whole. Hoping not to destroy all your desire for a ready-made lesson out of today's webinar, it is a fact that a complex economy like the Chinese one doesn't hold low-hanging fruits anymore. Local competition and pricing are both brutal. And what is needed from your side is, of course, a sound uh, data analysis before you step foot into this new market. Of course, China might not be everybody's cup of, cup of tea at the moment, but we tried in today's webinar to select some cases that actually succeeded uh, and thrived in, in China's economies uh, in these days. But for Let's take a pessimistic approach then, and following HPR's research on this topic, let's see why have foreign firms failed in the past. As you can see from the list in the lower end of this slide, a very large number of aggressive and determined local competitors will try to attack your market entry as soon as it happens. Of course, if you end up underestimating the major differences between digital business and other industries, you might get lost in the complexities of the local market. Another point would be 
a failure to develop and communicate business strategies effectively given cultural differences over here. Um, one point especially uh, indicating uh, the, the difficulties that the manufacturing sector is facing over here in China could be the ineffective innovation or trying to roll out over here R&D that is not really uh, made and shaped for China. Another point to be noted, and that will be the last for this slide, it's the failure to fully embed operations over here, leaving your China entity completely dependent on uh, the foreign mother company. Let's move on with the first case today, and that will be the German automotive industry champion, Volkswagen AG. 28 symbolized, as data shows in the, in the below slide, that the German car producer Volkswagen reached 4.2 million vehicles delivered to Chinese customers. All these in a market where electric vehicles and probably self-driving ones are taking over the streets of its main cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou and Shenzhen. How to achieve that and how has Volkswagen Group achieved that in the previous, in the previous months and years? Well, turning a solid rock German innovator into a more Chinese company, as Volkswagen CEO Herbert Deiss recently announced in, a, in an interview. So let's move on and let's realize that one of the first issues that Volkswagen Group had on China was having a large choice among which kind of products and brands to source locally and which other to simply import from uh, foreign manufacturing centers. You can see this, that as of today, Volkswagen is the uh, largest brand holder in the automotive sector. You might, you might recognize some names like, like Audi, Seat, Bugatti, Lamborghini, and so on. And please take into account that still uh, half of it, uh, around half of those brands, are still simply uh, imported here in China without any local production. I'm mainly referring to uh, Scania commercial vehicles, whereas for buses, Scania actually has a manufacturing joint venture in Shandong province as of the last months. But you might see that the luxury sector namely Bentley, Lamborghini, Porsche, and Ducati for the, um, for the motorsport one, is actually still part of the products that uh, Volkswagen simply, simply imports over here. Um, what happened to uh, Volkswagen is that the three joint ventures that it rolled out in China are namely involved in producing Skoda cars, Volkswagen, and other branded vehicles that are namely for uh, everyday usage. When talking about what to keep at home, discussions on how to establish joint ventures uh, with Chinese counterparts wasn't really possible in a highly regulated sector as the automotive one for Volkswagen. Foreign control of such sectors or only foreign owned plants are in fact not allowed here as we speak. So that said, what happened to Volkswagen was that entering the Chinese market meant uh, choosing local partners in, all, in order to roll out joint ventures and produce. Uh, cars and commercial vehicles with. Once again, stepping back on e-cars, imagine what platform can the previous sales data and brand recognition offer the moment that Volkswagen plans to produce around uh, 11.6 million e-cars in China by 2028. That will include local platforms for hyper-compact e-cars and a recharge network adding up to China already widespread locations that are serving e-cars uh, users nowadays. Hoping to avoid stimulating any munches if you didn't have breakfast or lunch for whomever is based in Asia, KFC American fast food giant comes next with some impressive Darwinian evolution lessons. Spacing from 73 to 87, you can see uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken history from uh, setup in Hong Kong to exit from that market because of uh, not sufficient sales, sales results. And 87 basically marked the opening of the first KFC store in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. It was also the first joint venture company in the city at that time. And due to underperforming results, basically China took over other two markets at that time, namely Hong Kong and Taiwan in the greater China region. The greater involvement of KFC in the Chinese market meant that KFC had to introduce franchising as a business model into China. And this basically funneled rapid expansion 
after the Chinese government granted uh, further further investment by by foreign foreign investors over here. What happened in the in the early 2000s is that KFC opens dozens of new locations every year in China's first tier cities, and after starting with just four restaurants, as of 2019, it holds more than 5,000 uh, food stalls, holding more than 40 percent of the local market for food, uh, fast food chains. But what was KFC's special recipe to succeed here? Amazingly enough, nothing new to the local cookbook, but KFC's own version of the Chinese household's favorite. Have a look at a picture in the lower hand of this slide, and you might realize that this looks like nothing you would find in an American uh, KFC shop. Um, if, you, if you're able to zoom in the in the central picture with chicken sticks around around a rice uh, a rice dish you might also see that the english translation of their uh, of the chinese writings also contains uh, mistakes uh, and that's basically what happened after you localize a company in a way that it's basically seen as a chinese champion over here of course local taste varies from region to region and KFC had to adapt requests for Eastern China's consumers that were complaining about uh, the spiciness of its food over here. Whereas in Western regions, uh, namely Sichuan and Hunan, spiciness is actually a value and consumers were, were asking for, for further options in order to have hot and, and spicy food delivered to their, uh, to their homes. What we can see in, in the flavor of its, of its own product is that KFC really turned itself into a Chinese company targeting Chinese consumers. And that was basically possible thanks to a four tire approach with its main strategies recapped into this slide. We can see that KFC had fried chicken as its core product along with highly specialized uh, and localized menus uh, that have won all the visitors' hearts. Um, employing bilingual local partners was also a main strategy for KFC as KFC first management team in China were all from Taiwan, a territory that is part of China and of course shares cultural, economical and traditional roots with the mainland. Embracing local culture was also a winning key and a crucial part of KFC strategies. In order to appeal to local customers, they turned the local food stalls into re replicas of Beijing traditional uh, districts namely the hutong and nothing uh, similar to what they would actually use in, in the us knowledge of the local market was also was also essential to the success of this uh, foreign food producer over here in, in in china and by striking the art of the chinese society they really understood that dining table is a family thing over here and also understood the 4 to 1 indulgence which is including four grandparents, two parents, and one child in their family packages delivered to the, to the customer's door. Of course, toys in combos, just like in other, in other competitors, like, like McDonald's, were also winning strategies. The more, the more China open is one child policy. Some of, you, some of you might have been waiting for a UK champion along the way to the previous slides, and here it comes. UK education and the case of University of Nottingham in Nimbo. This basically comes right at a time when previous trends highlighting the USA Ivy League as the main place to be for Chinese students were now, with the now ongoing trade wars, keeping commercial flows and cultural exchange on shaking grounds, we can see that the UK has taken over the US in being the education leader over here in China. Of course, when Chinese students start thinking about where to study abroad, they consider a lot of factors, including the kind of relationship that the country has, has engaged with China. We know that the UK is entering uh, its renewed golden era of uh, relationship with, with China, and we see Chinese students flocking to universities in the United Kingdom as British education institution keeps in, on increasing their overseas marketing effort. You can see data uh, reported from China Daily, and they are very promising for those of you that come from the educational sector. But let's jump right in the case of University of Nottingham. Instead of bridging China to the UK, have you ever thought about bridging the UK to China? Well, that's what UON did in Nimbo. We can see that their partnership 
in the Zhejiang province city uh, with Zhejiang Wali Group, basically aimed at setting up a fully run UK university right uh, in one of China's uh, most wealthy prov provinces. Uh, courses are entirely held in English and they share the same standards as back at home in Nottingham. Uh, what happens is that British universities have actually put recruiters at, at work for, for scouting talents over here in China, uh, but Nottingham University over here had already a base of local knowledge thanks to its presence in the Chinese market. Of course, when we look at other factors that lead uh, University of, ne of Nottingham to succeed, we can see that UNNC offers undergraduate students with an identical degree from the University of Nottingham, even though it's fully taken over here in China. You can also choose for a 2 plus 2 program, which allows you to stay two years over here in China in the Nimbo campus and then complete your, uh, your path of studies with two years in the UK. It's still the main choice for Chinese students who want to receive a top tier uh, educational degree without having to leave China. And this is also possible thanks to the fact that Ningbo, although being a Chinese second tier city, is still home to China's, uh, China's riches uh, developing on, on the, on the local, local harbor that took over in recent years. If we sum up the four year tuition fee plus the cost of living uh, held locally, the program with University of Nottingham in Imbo is still a third cheaper than the same run back at home by, by Nottingham Uni uh, for the four years uh, it will take. Right on the words of China then CEO and Provost uh, of U University of Nottingham and now Vice Chancellor, we can see how recruiting methods and social media uh, presence were key already more than five years ago. And that has been moving uh, University of Nottingham strategy in order to attract in more and more talents locally instead of having to relay, uh, re rely on agents uh, sourced locally in order to have students then flocking back to the UK. When we look at the policies that the UK is also rolling out in order to uh, envisage further opportunities for uh, Chinese students uh, that graduate from universities back at home, we can see that the new post-study uh, post work visa will allow international students with undergraduate level degrees and above to stay in the UK and work up to two years after graduation. There will be no restriction on the type of work that one can do and graduates will basically be available to have valuable overseas working experience adding value to their CVs and then come back to China for further work opportunities in case they want. Of course, um, applicants will need to have a valid Tier 4 student visa to qualify for the uh, grade, uh, graduate road and the summer 2021 should be the deadline to complete courses for them. Basically, thanks to the UK government and universities China focus approach, the education industry is booming over a year and more and more students are choosing the UK to grow even further. Both parents and, stu and students in China nowadays are eager to invest into a better education in order to improve their positioning and their starting point in the hyper competitive labor market back home, which is something that we can never, uh, we, we, can ne we always need to remember when looking at China. So how to deal with local dealers is always a question that comes up when facing F&B industry and product safety and quality registration together with high duties and complex lo logistic issues always target those uh, wine traders and producers that are looking at China as a market entry. We take now the wine trader Frexonet and its Cava produce as an example of how a foreign market actor has actually succeeded over here in China. So apart from Spanish wine's general data, it's basically impressive how Cava from Spain has actually found its, its way of, of working up uh, the ranks over here in China by finding its position as setting its own targets, uh, as, as we say, choosing its own battles. So we had Champagne from France being the market leader over here, 
another uh, pro uh, product from Italy being uh, Italian Prosecco, and then Cava had to decide whether to aim for the top or simply attack the second place over here. Well, it chose the second option, and that has proved as a successful strategy for them over here. We can see the difference between the grapes and the region from where these free wines are from, together with the country they belong to. Uh, the method of Cava is actually more similar to Champagne than the, than the one of Prosecco, but that doesn't really matter because what we should look is actually how Frexenet access the local market. You can see that we can track back the relationship between Frexenet and its local uh, supplier, ASC Fine Wines, uh, down to the foundation of the Chinese company as wine trader and provider of solutions related to fine wines over here in China. What happens is that now ASC holds and distributes more than 1,200 uh, 1, wines from 100 wineries around the world, and it does so over here in China via uh, e-commerce platform like Jindong and Timo. What happened is that Frexenet at that time used to be one of the first sparkling wines to be retailed in China, and that very first step into, into this market has gained a lot of success uh, in, the, in the coming years. We can see that generally Spain now ranks number three among the exporters of the highest dollar value worth wine, but it's also the third biggest exporter of wine to China uh, as of 2018. What happens is that the Spanish, the Spanish market for, for uh, Ch uh, Chinese thirst of wine is projected to exceed actually the one in the UK and, and second only to the US. And we can see that by the, t by the, the, the graphic showed in the, the left end of, of this of this slide, Cava will basically triplicate its uh, total uh, retail sales value by the uh, by the end of 2022. And of course, this is a projection, but we can see that the initial data in 2013 was basically 18 uh, million US dollars, whereas in 2022, approximately 60 million uh, US dollars will be retailed over here in China. You can see that. Basically, Spain is nowadays the, th the third in the list, and Italy and France comes up. But Cava is still the main, the main choice for sparkling wine over here in China, no matter how, how famous uh, Champagne and Prosecco is for, for higher end, of course, uh, products. I hope you're still with us as we touch the last case of today's series. And it's time for you to imagine to be sitting in a Northern European living room, as I'll tell you about IKEA's foray over here in China. First thing, first thing first, let's start from the challenges that the Swedish furniture group faced in these years. Basically, we could, we could see that there is a completely differently, uh, uh, di different framework from back at home, whereas everybody got a car. China always buys via, via Metro. So the Metro support for the location run by IKEA was very important and locating them nearby the closest subway station was, was the main strategy of IKEA. So this was achieved by planning the next shop opening together with the government authorities in order to understand where the next Metro station was located in the outskirts of China's main cities. Of course, as we look at the product cat catalog versus digital marketing, we need to understand that here in China, nothing comes off on paper anymore, but uh, China is already smartphoneized well before uh, other, other jurisdictions in, in Western Europe. So everything comes out of your phone in cool WeChat contents or online, online marketing strategies. Of course, China was not really familiar with uh, Scandinavian cultures and the taste for um, local produce. This reflected uh, the choice of design in, in, in IKEA's uh, product retailed over here in China, but a simple and neat style actually became part of the Chinese rising uh, middle class over here, and that was a point on which IKEA actually succeeded. On the fourth point, legal barriers. When we look at the structure of IKEA Group, we can see that they invested into a main woofie that then had to invest into another company simply held by the by the first Wufi over here in China in each and every location that they open up. So if you look at the organizational chart of IKEA China nowadays, you will see more than 10 entities located and distributed throughout uh, Chinese provinces and, 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 and cities. 
Another point to be, to be careful on was basically the pricing strategy. The Chinese consumers, especially the one in the middle class, are always very price sensitive, and that was a, was a success factor for, for IKEA uh, low-cost product. Uh, another strategy that they actually uh, leveraged on was to match uh, local furniture retail over here in China together with food actually sourced out uh, Sweden first, and then locally retailed over here in China. So each and every location of IKEA actually becomes more famous on, on food first, attracting flocks of, of uh, food tourists that then become consumers. Because if you look at their ice cream, for example, their price is much lower than McDonald's Sundays. And that's, and that's just an example. I could go on on steaks, but that's not the main, the main target of today's case. So what happened is that IKEA targeted the upper middle class as it appeared to, to show up as, as the rising uh, co consumer of tomorrow. The middle class in China over here has grown more, has grown modern in taste and therefore Western style furniture was on high demand. Uh, with local spin spinsters and couples facing a rapid economic development, nobody was able to say where they would live actually the year after or even uh, five years from now. So this meant that they needed cheap furniture that could be relocated easily and maybe just change year after year. So that was IKEA's approach. And since one living room fits most, that's the solution that they applied over here in China. We can see that the World Bank has ranked China as an upper middle class country, as its growth um, per capita income was US dollar 8,827 in 2017. And amid an economic slowdown, of course, com convenient and cheap furniture is still a way to go over here whenever the middle class decide to stabilize whatever whatever outflow of cash they need to they need to consider for their household we can see that mckinsey and company forecast china's middle class to, to reach 550 million by 2022 and comprise 75 percent of urban households moving on on the e-commerce strategy of ikea we can see that in august 2019 ikea announced it would invest 10 billion renminbi 1.41 billion US dollars in the Chinese market for the upcoming 2020 fiscal year. The largest amount in IKEA's China's history in order to move its commercial operation and digitalization forward. By the end of the year, IKEA will roll out also a new app, allowing customers to basically visualize the products they want to purchase in their own households by simply clicking on the products they want to choose and taking pictures or video of how the living room looks at the moment. Of course, this will allow them to have less uh, consumers forced to travel into their, uh, to their shops and simply buying products directly from China's e-commerce platforms like Jindong, Tmall and others mentioned in, in the previous slides. Meanwhile, IKEA is committed to provide consumers with new experience by activities, exploring new business models. Starting from September, both IKEA's offline and online platforms will try to offer house design services in order to have completely blank houses directly designed by IKEA design masters. We can see that from the uh, quote-unquote uh, Anna uh, Paula Kuliga, the president of IKEA China, China's market for home furnishing is currently in a period of steady growth and that's what IKEA will use to foray its, its further investment over here in China. We are now at the conclusion of today's uh, webinar. And as we come to the end, it's good for us to basically recap the lessons that we learned from these five cases in order to turn them into five stepping stones for your investment into China. What happened over here is that we can find five main lessons and that would be the usage of the investment forms and that would be joint ventures for Volkswagen spurring localization, and that would be the case of KFC and their completely Chinese stores over here, uh, then we would be analyzing the mark, uh, finding your own market position as Frexen et Cava did over here in a market that was already filled up by Italian Prosecco and, and French Champagne, of course. And then the focus of marketing that IKEA has taken in recent years in order to be able to 
develop digital strategies that were aiming at taking consumers directly from China's uh, online e-commerce in a sector that actually is still very offline in terms of uh, the offer of products. Of course, this means that there is no real strategy for China as long as you don't dare to learn from, from mistakes that might happen over here. While always presenting China as a whole, it's always proper to remember that there are still huge differences between different provinces, coastal areas and the inner ones, in terms of population, GDP, average income, spending habits, education level and culture. So our lessons for the day would be namely to identify the geographical location of your investment over here in China, think about China's clusters located up north in the east, west or in, in the south in China's growing Greater Bay Area, choose between the different corporate forms depending on the activities and the market strategy that you have. You can choose between a wholly foreign-owned enterprise, a joint venture if your market is still um, presenting high market access barrier or a rep office if you simply need to uh, undergo business development and marketing activities or attending fairs with a local representative. Of course, this needs to happen after round and thought of marketing research has already been launched on the Chinese market because your product might not be suited or might need, might need to be changed uh, for the local market or regulations. Think, for example, to cosmetics producers that still nowadays are forced to have uh, their own products tested on animals, whereas that's not part of the industry anymore in the rest of the world. At point four, we will still put hiring the right staff because this was important, for example, for KFC when we said about their first management team uh, laid out for, for China. At point five, we would strive the fact that when targeting China, you're targeting China consumers first and understanding the local needs and their demands on your product might need you to completely review the heritage of the brand and also the history of how your product has succeeded in other markets. Uh, this is a choice you can take. Uh, China might either change you or actually make you more, more successful depending on how you take it. And we will see that basically this was the last slide for, for my side. And as we come to the end of today, Jack, I can basically ask you to open the Q&A session and remember that this was basically the last uh, of the three webinars run by CBBC and Oxford. Um, so let, let's open let's open a Q&A and we can maybe find some more topics to uh, underline or to, to take out in today's session. Great, thank you, Fabio. I thought that was uh, that was that was really fascinating. You you raised quite a lot of uh, different topics, but things that are relevant to a wide range of different businesses. Uh, so I'm sure uh, that you've had some questions through. Uh, so I believe it's it's yourself and Katarina and Cindy that can see the questions that have come from the audience. So uh, hopefully people have been submitting questions throughout. Yeah, I can see I can see one from uh, Maggie McLaughlin, uh, mm -hmm. and the, and the question goes: I heard that the Chinese government has opened up market in some particular sectors for companies uh, that wishes to, to set wholly foreign-owned enterprise over here. Uh, the example of Tesla Shanghai might be relevant for the automotive sector. Uh, is it true that the factory is wholly foreign-owned by by Tesla? So the point would be. Yes, it's correct. And the information that you had on Tesla uh, actually matches reality. Uh, the only issue is that Tesla has been the championing case that uh, local authorities are presenting to local investment uh, whenever, whenever this comes up. Uh, but you can also consider that uh, Tesla didn't have to invest one single penny out of their own pocket in this market, as most of the uh, registered capital and total investment uh, in the in the China in the, in the Chinese power factory actually came from um, credit uh, found locally in in Chinese banks and credit ventures. So it is true for sensible cases and for particular investment uh, projects, uh, China has its own way in order to uh, 
lay out uh, detailed regulation and, all, and also to shape the existing one. On the automotive sector, I have to remind you that uh, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang mentioned that earlier than 2020, China will probably open up the sectors. So if that's the only reason why, for example, Volkswagen and other uh, car makers are, are, are having to have those vehicles over here in China, uh, that might be not the case anymore because they would be able to, to run woofies over here. I guess that at that time, uh, it would be probably too little too late as they already invested uh, a huge amount of, of funds into those vehicles and they will probably continue to run uh, those joint ventures by putting their own woofies aside and starting little by little to increase uh, the share of market that those woofies uh, can take. Of course, it would be challenging to see how those future woofies will uh, basically uh, touch base with the, with the local joint ventures that uh, car makers open. Uh, but that is already the case because if you think about the three joint ventures that I mentioned before, they are usually held in three different regions of China, but then dealership and the second and uh, car markets might actually get through having those three joint ventures actually competing on the same consumers, which is quite funny if you think about how, how big the Chinese market is. Great, so quite a different picture across uh, different sectors, but I think what something that's clear to me that from what you've said today is that China's changing quickly and, and the different regulations in different sectors and, and the level of openness kind of changes so people would be best to speak to specialists uh, like yourselves in order to get a, uh, a relevant um, and up-to-date answer uh, for the business that they run and the sector that they operate in. Um, have you got a, another question through Fabio? Yeah absolutely I think there is one uh, from uh, Brian Bog, and that's related to different biz business models, uh, not really to invest over here in China, but to partner up with local uh, enterprises. Uh, it goes like this, is there an appetite in China for partnership working? Example given, we are in the education industry and would like to partner over here with a, with a local uh, Chinese university, and we are trying to see if the educational products are actually uh, good for this strategy? Well, absolutely. It, it doesn't need to, to really become a campus, the, uh, the actual partnership that you're in, uh, envisaging for the, for the local market. Uh, there is plenty of UK universities that have already set up research and development center, uh, centers in China's main industrial sectors like chemical, uh, civil engineering, and so on, and you might find lots of them if you access CBBC's uh, case studies, uh, but also the diplomatic network from the, uh, the Great Britain presence over here in eastern, southern, and, and the northern Chinese region. Um, if we look at, for example, the, um, the Yangtze River Delta, we can see that, for example, not only Shanghai was targeted by these projects, uh, but also University of Nantong, and other um, low tire uh, Chinese cities already have their China uh, Knowledge Center for UK universities with either professors or researchers that are actually based here and trying to see if there is a local appetite for common initiatives and maybe um, studying program, of course, on, on, on China. Awesome. Thanks, Fabio. Um, I think you've probably got time for, for one more question from the audience if, uh, if you've got one through. Yeah, absolutely. I'll take the chance, actually, because I'm, I'm seeing very detailed questions coming in from the audience and I will basically take them on by, by email because uh, yep. they might be not the right one to be targeted over here. Um, let's just take back some of the questions that came over with uh, registration. Uh, because one, it's it's quite spot on. Uh, it comes from uh, Rachel Bezan from, uh, um, and, and it states, at what stage do you recommend investing uh, in an underground Chinese speaker or employee plus an office before committing to China? So over here, I think we need, 
we need to totally re revolutionize the starting point. Uh, at Oxford, we usually give um, uh, three part strategies advice on companies that are looking at investing over here. We basically tell them that it will be the case to invest in a, in a local either woofy or joint venture the moment that they have three basic needs. And one would be the need to hire local staff for BD activities or for whatever uh, mission or, uh, or vision that the company has on the Chinese market. The need to issue local VAT invoices to Chinese counterparts because that becomes a challenge, of course, when you have, for example, products that need to be uh, imported locally and companies uh, that are actually purchasing uh, those don't really want to take up the, uh, the challenge. Another activity and point that would need to be considered whenever deciding to invest over here would be the fact that having staff on the ground and running local activities might jump up uh, to the point that you need to have a business license or a certificate of registration for a, for a rep office in order to be sure to be actually uh, compliant with uh, China company law over here. So I would actually focus on the needs uh, that your plan on China uh, lays out instead of deciding at what point you will you will actually uh, want to invest over here. Starting from those needs and laying out a business plan together with the expenses that you need will actually create the register capital of the total investment that you laid out on China and basically already providing you with the backbone of the, the project that you want to run locally. Awesome. I I think Fabio, if you've got any more general questions, um, then it'd be good to good to hear your answer for everybody's benefit. As you say, if they're quite specific to individual businesses, then then it's great that you're going to be able to follow up with people uh, separately afterwards. Um, so have you have you got any more that you want to answer now, or are you taking it all offline? Yeah, there is an interesting one related to a sector that is always a challenge for any consultants uh, that, is, that is active here in China. Uh, that would be, what should the overreaching strategy be for uh, like to launch a foreign startup into a targeted Chinese consumer space that comes from Hugh Thompson um, from 874 miles. What happens is that uh, startups in China are actually a very sens uh, sensible matter, uh, most likely because to be a startup over here, you would need to have business license. Uh, there is no real investment form that is suggested for those vehicles that are trying to be disruptive. And of course, being disruptive might also, might also mean the fact that you don't, you don't hold office premises, uh, which is one of the needs uh, in order to have a business license over here. So it's basically a cat biting its tail. Together with that, you might also see the fact that in order to have a business license, you have to have a registered capital and startuppers and founders might actually be seeking for investment instead of writing down some on, on their business license or articles of association. So together with that, we need to consider that disruption in general and innovation comes out from uh, um, sectors that over here in China are over-regulated. Think about uh, the e-commerce market or, for example, the communication sectors in general. Well, most of the of the startups uh, that come out uh, Silicon Valley or uh, the London-based startup scene or the, the European one, we can see that if you have any anything related to online, well, online content over here, just like paper-based one, is very uh, is very controlled. Uh, together with that, if you're using one of the platforms like Google, Facebook, Instagram, in order to run your solutions for your startups, well, that wouldn't be true over here in China because those uh, those websites are actually blocked uh, to local consumers. So I would say that it's good if if startups actually look for investments from uh, from Chinese uh, counterparts, and that should happen with a double-sided vehicle that is able not only to uh, reach out for RMB funds uh, that can only be um, listed locally, but also using, for example, Hong Kong or Singapore as uh, listing jurisdictions because basically Chinese VC funds are always based over there with USD portfolios and, and so on. 
So I would say look at investment first and, and then decide if the step to China really matters for your solution. Because it might be that entering the market when you're still seeking for investment would not be the right choice. So we've seen actually startups that already succeeded back at home targeting China for further uh, expansion when they were not startup uh, anymore. I, th I think this will be the right advice, uh, especially if you're still consider, let's say, a traditional small and medium enterprise. Um, that will be all from my side. Great, I think that's some really valuable advice, Fabio. Uh, thank you very much. Um, do you want me to bring this to a close now? Unless we don't have any other question from the audience, I guess we can close. Okay, great. If anybody does have more questions, please do feel free to email uh, Fabio uh, or his colleague uh, from Hawksford. Um, also, feel free to get in touch with us here at CBBC. Uh, if you're a UK company looking at exporting to China, we're here. Uh, we've got a team throughout the UK, so enquiries at cbbc.org. Uh, for Fabio, it's Fabio Stella at hawksford.com. I think that's right, isn't it, Fabio? Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to remind the audience that all the questions that you submitted during the webinar will actually be answered by our site. So don't worry if you asked, you will receive your answer in the coming days. Perfect. Thank you very much, Fabio. Well, thank you, everybody, for spending uh, an hour uh, in our company this morning. I hope you found it useful. Uh, I know I certainly learned a lot from it, um, and I hope to see you uh, at future events, webinars, uh, and other functions in the future. Thanks again, Hawksford, for providing the content for all these webinars. Um, I think it's been an excellent series, and if you missed them, uh, do catch up with them. Uh, through Hawksford or CBBC channels uh, for more content. Uh, have a wonderful day, everybody, and looking forward uh, to seeing you all soon.